This time we've got a Cowager Arms, uh, long action. It is their VPR 338 action. Uh, kind of a, another Remington 700 style uh, custom action. Um, it's going to be chambered in 300 Norma Mag. And the interesting part about this is it's West Texas Ordinance's um, switch, switch lug. Switch lug by West Texas Ordinance. Um, I'll get some close ups of this in there. But uh, what this allows the customer to do, um, rather than uh, fitting and chambering a, a, a barrel the typical way you would uh, by torquing it on anywhere from 75 to 100 foot pounds. Or, or whatever. Uh, this one, um, I've made a kind of a sample here before I actually machine the real barrel just to make sure I got all my bearings straight and, and whatnot. Um, so basically what, what, what would happen, um, this, is, this allows the customer or the owner of the rifle uh, that doesn't have machines and, and wrenches and, and vices and things like that. So they'll take their, their barrel, simply screw it in there, until it uh, bottoms out on the shoulder of the barrel. So the barrel still will have a shoulder, a traditional shoulder. And so you, you get it hand tight, maybe maybe a little more in a vise or something like that. Um, but the but the kind of neat part is it's got this Torx uh, screw here um, on the switch lug itself. So you've got a traditional recoil lug that is recessed into the face of the receiver. And then on pin to that is is this switch lug. Uh, so you take a uh, T, probably a T20 Torx bit, and tighten that down. I think the recommended was 30 inch pounds. So you'll torque that down to 30 inch pounds, at, which locks the barrel essentially into place. Pretty neat uh, concept, actually. This is the first time I've seen it or really even heard of it. Um, so obviously the guy could have several different barrels. And <clears throat> West Texas Ordinance has a pretty pretty nice explanation of, of the features and the benefits of using the system on their website. Um, so, you know, kind of for example, big game, dangerous game hunting, you know, you could have it chambered in, like this one, a 300 Norma mag. Uh, then a guy could get a, 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 a totally different barrel, uh, chambered in whatever. You may have to switch out the bolt, obviously. The bolt faces have to accommodate the cartridge. But uh, Calgar Arms, um, they have kind of a hybrid on the Savage floating, um, floating bolt head. Uh, so what a guy could do, so say you've got your 300 Norma mag and you want something for target shooting or, or you know, practice or whatever, uh, something less recoil, more manageable, less expensive, what have you. You'd uh, a guy would switch out the bolt head, put in his standard bolt face or whatever, take that barrel off, put the new barrel on, and you're off to the races with the same action and stock and, and, and what have you. So, pretty cool, pretty cool concept. Um, it's got an interesting uh, tenon. They provide a drawing and the, and the call outs and all the dimensions and specifications for the tenon. And this, uh, the, uh, where, the section of the barrel where the switch lug rides on is actually tapered, ten thousandths, with it about three hundred fifty thousandths, so almost three eighths of an inch. It's tapered, uh, which I assume allows that lock to lock a little bit better. Uh, I'm sure they've got their reasons for it. A uh, little bit uh, different process when you're fitting this. Uh, definitely nothing out of the scope of uh, abilities or anything. If you can read a print and machine things to two dimensions and within specs and tolerances, it's fine. That's why I made this kind of stub, uh, just to make sure there's no surprises on the real barrel. You know, the last thing I want to do is ruin a barrel or make it shorter. So. <laughs> So anything, anyway, everything's uh, kosher on this. Um, we got the taper for the switch lug, the length, uh, relief cut, and they have also kind of a hybrid 
cone slash flat breech uh, system here. Uh, that's a 20 degree uh, taper, or not taper, but a cone, essentially, um, which matches the bolt, the bolt face there. So, yeah, kind of interesting. Uh, I thought this would be kind of fun to share, uh, the process of building this. Um, I'm probably not going to show the entire machining process. That's kind of redundant at this point. But um, I think I'll I'll do stages at least, you know, kind of the finished barrel tannin, get some close-ups of that, <clears throat> and then finishing it off. Um, we're going to be putting in this uh, uh, another unique uh, component here. This is a Wooks Wooks stock. So we've got a combination uh, wood and aluminum. So the bedding area is all aluminum, I assume. Yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely not the lightest weight <clears throat> stock, but it is pretty cool. I mean, you've got adjustments here, length of pull, cheek riser, uh, kind of snazzy looking, fancy. Uh, so that'll be interesting too. We're going to go with uh, Hawkins Precision, uh, their Hunter Bottom Metal, a detachable magazine. So this is nice, it's a uh, flush fit, and uh, looks like it probably holds three rounds. So detachable box mag, standard M5, uh, cut out for the bottom metal. Uh, floor plate, or uh, mag release right here in your, in your trigger guard. So yeah, that's uh, it's kind of a cool, cool rifle. Uh, as of this date, I only have one barrel to chamber for this, but I believe it's been a while since I talked to the customer, um, Alexander. I'm sure he's going to want another barrel for this, so at that time, you know, we'll, we'll chamber that up for him too. So for now, uh, I'm going to get started on the barrel work and uh, kind of proceed from there. So the action's ready. I don't have to take measurements. Um, they do provide the all this, the dimensions and length and everything here, which does line up with everything. So the bolt closes on this, everything's cool there. Uh, headspace is called out here. Um, so as, as I always do, I'll, I'll, I'll do minimal headspace on this. Uh, and yeah, should be a, should be a fun project. So uh, stay tuned and uh, we'll be back with, uh, with progress reports. Got the barrel obviously installed, centered up. I turned down the first, uh, the, the largest dimension, which is 1.073 plus or minus one thousandths. And we're there. Let's go ahead and get a micrometer. And I've test fit the switch lug and even though I'm over by one and a half tenths, let's see if that there it is. Uh, it still fits, and I'd rather stay a little bit on the high side. And that dimension is actually just right here at the basically where the shoulder is. That will taper down to 1.063 or 64, uh, about 300 thousandths from the shoulder. So at this point. I'm gonna I'll lay out my line for the end of that switch lug portion. Turn the rest of it down to 1.064. Make my relief. Do my taper. Finish off the thread tenon, which would be one and one sixteenth, which would be 1.062, and then basically cut the threads. So, like I said, at this point. We will mark out the next dimension for diameter and length. All right, back at the machine, I have all my lengths and diameters cut two dimension, two specs with intolerance. Um, the way I did the taper for the switch lug, so I set my compound uh, one degree. From zero. 
So basically that's exaggerated, but that's that's how I was achieving that ten thousandths taper ish. Um, so let's get this out of the way. Come on in and check things. long so I had to put in my one to two inch uh, rod in the uh, depth micrometer I like the mid uh, so anyway we were looking for uh, 1.174 from breech face to shoulder There she is. Hopefully, you can see that. Focus. 1.174. Right on the money. Now, the, the drawing doesn't call for any tolerance on that, so I think that needs to be dead on. That way, headspace is perfect every time. And then regardless, it is, so uh, that's fine. Uh, diameters, check with uh, one to two inch made of toil. Uh, diameters we're looking for, I already cut the thread tenon diameter, one and one sixteenth. So nominal would be 1.062. So I got 1.062. And a few tenths, half thousands. Um, I know cutting threads you want to go under the major diameter, but what I do is I'll I'll turn it down to, to nominal and then cutting the threads, once I get to depth, uh, my double depth, I'll just uh bird uh just uh file down the, the tops of the threads. Just a bit. I mean a couple swipes of the file and that'll get me under under so there's no binding or anything on the threads. Um, the uh, taper here measures 1.0, so that's 1.073 plus or minus 1. And at the, so up here at the shoulder, and then here at the end of the taper, you got to end up at 1.064 plus or minus 1. Now, this uh, micrometer. I don't have a fine enough point to measure that accurately at least. I mean I could come in and, and check like maybe on the very edge there, but it's a taper, so it's a continuous, continuous uh, kind of dimension. So the best way at least I have with what I have to work with is a set of calipers. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna use the the very fine ends here. And I've zeroed out the calipers and ensured that was right. So, right there at the shoulder, we got 1.074, or sorry, one, yeah, 1 1.074, nominal, and then at the very end of the taper, let's see if I can just grab that, 1.064, nee. there we go. So, we're within spec there. Got length. This uh, from the shoulder to the relief cut is 350 thousandths. So, yeah, it's gonna be kind of tricky to get in there, but just set it to 350. I don't know if you can see that, but that's not super critical as long as the switch lug goes over that and the <clears throat> the thread relief is exposed. The the thread excuse me the thread relief I cut with a uh, rounded radius cutter. And it's got a ra a radius nose, um, just to give it a little more strength, and that's what the drawings shows. There's no call out for that, but um, 
I just have to assume that's your minor diameter of the thread. So for one and one sixteenth by sixteen, that's my uh, minor diameter is going to be 0 0.985 plus or minus, you know, whatever. But that's just so the uh, the front, so there's no relief in the front of the receiver. There's no relief here. So that means you need some relief at the very end of the thread so that that guy can screw all the way on without binding. Um, one other thing to check is going to be the fit of the switch lug itself. So there's a the switch lug. Uh, the pin down goes into the receiver, obviously, so this, this would go on the barrel like this. So we'll just test that real quick, and yep, perfect fit. Um, obviously that screw's not tight, but now, and I did measure the switch lug, so it is 1.074 at the, at the front and 1.064-ish uh, in the back. So basically, taper meets taper. External taper meets internal taper. You cinch that screw down, you got a 100% contact on that, which will ensure that barrel will, will not come loose unless this screw is, is, is loosened. And 30 inch pounds on that screw should be plenty to hold that on. So, um, anyway, everything's looking great. And yet, now that I'm looking at this, I'm not sure why that relief is there since the, the recoil lug itself is going to be covering that up. But, yeah, I'm just going to cut this to the drawing to exactly what they're they're calling out. They know what they're doing, I'm sure. They built the action. So, anyway, um, next thing to do, I'm going to just... Um, doesn't call for it, but I always like to chamfer the uh, very start of the thread tenon. And that gives the tool just a little bit of a ramp to kind of, instead of a wall to hit it, it ramps it into the thread. Uh, that's debatable on whether or not that's even necessary, but... Anyway, I like to do it. It gives a little clearance for the very back of the receiver, too. Uh, so, so it doesn't hurt. Um, just kind of common practice from years and years and years of cutting threads. So yeah, I'm going to lay out, uh, basically, I don't even have to lay it out. I'm just going to set the machine, set my compound, you know, as you would for a 60-degree thread. So we're going to get a 60-degree off 90. Uh, feed the compound in each pass. Turn to zero here. Cut to depth and fit the receiver. Uh, so I'm going to switch up tooling and, and set up all the set the compound. Um, I'll be back uh, showing the fit of the of the receiver. All right, back here. Now we've got the threads cut <clears throat> to length <clears throat> and depth. And a test fit. So we'll drop the uh, switch lug assembly in place. Just get it started. It should go all the way to the shoulder with no gap. Cool. So that's probably even tighter than the customer's ever going to torque it on. So yeah, um, good with that. Let's just check and make sure there's no, <coughs> excuse me, gap. So we're light tight, turn it 90. Cool, yeah, I can see no light there. Crack it loose. And there's a little bit of light, and then it closes up. <clears throat> so I know I got 100% contact, 360 degrees all around that. This is torqued up, so that's how it'll look when the barrel is installed. So yeah, I'm happy with that. Next step is going to be the breech face. So, in order for the bolt to close, we have to cut those features that are called out for on the uh, on the print that will give clearance for the bolt nose, basically for the front of the bolt. So definitely want that to to close. 
bolt drop all the way down. So I'm going to screw off the cowager and set up the machine for cutting the breech face. Uh, there's a couple different angles and depths to, uh, to cut there. So anyway, I'll be right back when, uh, when that's complete and show you that. Alrighty. Breach face is done. We've got a basically a flat <clears throat> kind of flat fifty thousandths deep from the breach face. Uh, and then it's a twenty degree taper. Um, almost all the way out. There's a very very slight flat there at the crest of the uh, outside in the uh, breech face. So we got 675 from here to here for that flat. 50 thousandths depth as I said. And then the uh, the taper out here is going to be, or the cone I guess, uh, 950 thousandths edge to edge. So all that went well. Um, let's see if the, make sure the bolt closes on that. Back out a little bit. Okay. Reassemble the switch lug assembly. And screw it on in. Screwing in until we bottom out on that shoulder. Give it a little torque. Now the bolt should should just close. Alright. Closes. We got a little, little clearance there. So all that's done. Um, now all we got to do is cut the chamber. So we will set up for that. I'm going to pre-drill, clear out most of the material, and then finish ream the chamber to depth. It's looking like headspace is going to be. From the back of the cartridge, one inch, 266 thousandths, plus or minus two. So I'm thinking that's where your go gauge is going to be sitting. So we're going to have some positive headspace, one inch, 266 thousandths from the gauge to the shoulder. Um, may or may not end up there. Uh, Really, I'm going to go to actual physical headspace, meaning put the go gauge in, screw the action on, try to close the bolt. And uh, so if the bolt doesn't close, I'll measure, measure the gap here and finish reaming to that depth. Um, we may end up right there at 1.266, I'm not sure yet, but uh, regardless, uh, normally I'll just headspace, actual headspace, physical headspace. Um, the uh, call out here, I mean, for these boutique actions, usually it's right on the money, but um, other actions, usually the calculated headspace is a little bit off, but anyway, uh, like I said, I'm going to pre-drill, short of depth and width, diameter, and then I'll stick the finish reamer in, Is there a gun and, uh, in the house? and we'll finish that off, we'll finish that off next. Alright, so... Before we do any chambering, um, I'm not sure if I've actually. Oh geez, let me just drop everything here. I'm not sure if I've actually covered this in any of my prior videos, but uh, one thing I do, especially right before chambering, is I have a. I'll find the actual bore size. <coughs> Excuse me. All barrels are going to vary a little bit <coughs> in size meaning the internal diameter, um, the lands that is, and the grooves. The grooves you can measure with a slug, like a lead slug, if you, if you push a slug through the bore, you can measure with a micrometer, obviously a one to, or a zero to one. But uh, anyway, in this case, the point of this is to get the best fit for the, for the chambering reamer, because I use uh, live pilot reamers 
Um, been using a lot of Manson reamers. I'm really happy with them. They make great stuff. The only thing I don't like about Manson, I kind of hate the, the way they attach their pilots. It's held on by a C-clip. And man, those are just a pain to remove. Um, other reamer manufacturers put a screw, and it's just, I don't know, it's just so much easier. It's kind of nitpicking, but it's a small frustration to deal with. Because I, I don't know, maybe there's an easier way to get these off. I, I've just never known. I, what I do is I got a pair of pair of tweezers I've ground the tips down to and I'll, I'll try to get in there and, and just push it off like that and you know it works a lot most of the time the clip goes flying across the room and I'll never find it but they always send a couple extras in there anyway that being said I like to find the uh, a bushing that fits the bore basically perfectly we don't want certainly don't want it tight but we certainly don't want any play in there and so what I got here is a selection of bushings uh, they go from 2992 all the way up to 3006, 3008. So they're in two tenths of a thousandths increments. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll usually take the, the nominal size, the 300, three, so that's 300 thousandths. And fourth decimal place will be your ten thousandths. I'll, I'll fit this one. I'll basically just push it into the, into the bore, see if it fits. And if it's snug, I'll go down. If it's a little loose, I'll go up. A um, little bit easier way to do it, I'll, I'll install it on my range rod, the bushing that I'm testing, so that way I'm, I'm not losing it, basically, because they're only about this tall. So I'll just start it in. If it feels okay, I'll keep pushing until I get it within the bore, and then these range rods are tapered, so it will stop right around here. Um, but in this case, I found that the 2998 bushing is, is the basically optimal size for this one. So the bore is a little bit on the small side, uh, nothing wrong with that, that's not crazy. Uh, kind of prefer it to be a little bit on the tight side than the loose side. Uh, so I found the bushing that I like, I'm going to use that for the chambering reamer. Um, but before anything, I'm going to go ahead and check um, check my concentricity, basically Recentered if I have to because the the pressures and the and the Flex of the tool and all that from cutting the diameters and then the threading process Sometimes that'll shift the shift the barrel out of uh, alignment a little bit uh, usually not much, but um, I just like to get everything basically back to Zero where we started and I'll do this before threading and things like that. I just thought I'd take a second here and Kind of show that extra step that I, I always take with with barrels that I'm chambering so I'm going to walk over here to the lathe, so bear with me here. And, like I said, I'll just feed this in. And then I'll, I'll actually <clears throat> chamfer, chamfer the, uh, the bore, the mouth of the bore there, because also when we're cutting the steel, sometimes it'll, you know, I always cut from in out to pull the burr away, but inevitably you always usually end up with a burr there that's going to obstruct your, your since this is such a, uh, tight fit, not really tight, but you know, you don't want to be riding on a burr like that. So, get it started, and might be just a little flex in there from the from the machining. But there, I get past that point, and that feels real good. Um, the three oh 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 was just too tight. Like I would have to actually force it in, and that's definitely not what you want. Um, so this bushing I know is fitting the, the bore perfectly. So I'll just make sure that range rod's tapered out, bottomed out on the uh, the mouth of the the bore, and then, uh, like I said, we'll we'll just check it real quick, make sure we're still aligned. Okay, so I'll touch off, touch off, and then we'll just spin the. So yeah, we're about. Nine, nine, eight, eight, eight or nine tenths out, and that's normal. I mean, you know, you got to think that tool. I mean, I don't take very deep cuts. I take light, twenty thousandths at the most when I'm turning it, and the threading four to five thousandths at the most, and I kind of back off from there as I get deeper and deeper. But you know, that that kind of stuff. That's that's pretty much normal for any machining operation. So before we chamber, I'll just get this back back to where we started 
and it shouldn't take much. Find a high spot, and there we are. Within half of a tenth of a, so a millionth. I might just try to find the one tiny high spot. Nah, we're not moving. You're going to get a little bit of a deflection on that from a myriad of different things. So, if I can, if I can find the high spot, I'll, there, there's something. I just don't want this loose. Okay. Jeez, I'm just clumsy mother, clumsy mother today. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'm happy with that. <clears throat> We're gonna set up for reaming. Like I said, I'm gonna pre-drill first and then ream it. So, we'll be back when we're to depth. <clears throat> All right, there it is, completed breach. All right, so I got everything nicely polished. Um, and finished. Put a slight chamfer from the transition of the chamber to the breach, the cone breach there. Little 45, I don't know, 16th inch wide. Now this barrel will be seen by by the guy that owns it. So I just made sure everything looked pretty dang good. Polished everything real nice. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a done breach. Let's just uh, do one final headspace check. And uh, we'll get it out of the machine. All right, got our 300 Norma <clears throat> go gauge, made by Manson. Our Cowlger Arms VPR 338 with our Texas Ordnance. West Texas Ordnance. Switch lug. Oops. Make sure that's in there. Screw on receiver till the shoulder, to the shoulder. Give it a little, little bump. That's the extractor going over it. And we're closed. Minimal headspace, there's really no play there. And um, a lot of rifle builders will do this. Um, instead of a no-go gauge, we'll just put a piece of tape on the back there. Okay, single piece of single piece of cellophane tape on the back of the gauge represents about two thousandths of an inch, and it will not close on that. I can force it, but why do that? Don't do that. Okay. So this barrel is well within tolerances for headspace. Pull off the tape. And she closes. Minimal. Great. So we can take the barrel out. Um, I'll do a test fire. Test fire. Make sure the chamber is fine inside. It looks good, but you never know. Uh, test fire it. Swap the barrel around, do the breech or the muzzle end. He wants uh, 5 8 24 threads on there, so we will cut crown and thread the muzzle end next. Well, here we are, completed rifle. Um, off camera, obviously I uh, assembled it, put it together, the stock and everything. Um, one note about this stock, which was very well. A little annoying. Um, <clears throat> when I assembled everything, it wouldn't feed out of the magazine because it was sitting too low. It wouldn't catch the round. 
I found that kind of shocking. Uh, you'd think a stock such as this, I'm not sure what they cost, but um, I don't know if it was an incompatibility between uh, Hawkins Precision and this stock. Um, I've used plenty of Hawkins Precision before, never had that problem. So I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna chalk it up to, to the uh, stock here. So when, what I ended up having to do was take everything apart, <clears throat> stick it in the mill, and basically deepen the, uh, the cut, the, uh, I don't think it's an M5, but the, the magazine cut. I had to deepen that by a good 30 to 40 thousandths of an inch. Which was tricky on a manual machine. Uh, I didn't get footage of it, but you know, going around radiuses and, and all that is a little bit tricky, but um, not outside the realm of my abilities there. So I made it work, and uh, it feeds out of the magazine now just fine. So, anyway, I don't know, I might contact Wooks and just see what the heck was up about that. <clears throat> Be that as it may, it works now. Minor, minor, minor thing. Uh, test fired it. The uh, cartridge came out perfect. There's no issues with the chamber. No pressure beyond what a 300 normal mag would actually give you. And boy, there's some recoil packed in this guy. Um, it is fairly lightweight packaged, but, uh, but yeah, you're not going to be shooting this very much. <laughs> consecutively at least. Um, so anyway, just wrapping this video up, uh, it, again, it was just an interesting build. Uh, I thought I'd share it. So uh, anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell notification if you'd like to be notified of future videos, and I'll see you on the next one. See ya.